<laughs> so I, I give Connor all kinds of crap because he he still hasn't got a dunk for me yet. Yeah, <laughs> coach, I'm not a dunker. That's you got to get one. You, know, so you, you got to get one. I do. Have you're to get you're gonna be healthy. You feel good. Just yeah. sometimes, even if you just go in and when you shouldn't and try to hammer it, make your dad mad. <laughs> you one did time. that once. You did that against Michigan. I remember that. I did. I, I hadn't tried it my whole career, and then against Michigan, all you tried of to sudden, dunk on like four people. Oh yeah, I tried to dunk on. We were we were high fiving. We played for oohs and ahs back in the yeah. days. <laughs> After the camp, my players and I was ran up to him and started doing the gritty. <laughs> and he got mad. I'll never forget the face of this cheerleader for the rest of my life. Have you met the football players? <laughs> they are the worst guys on campus. Kate's like, yeah, we know blue too. And it's like yelling it out and stuff. You're, 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 you're. Sometimes he'll be in the hallway just pounding push-ups going like, Great morning, gentlemen! <laughs> You have to use the bleep button a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that might be. And now a message from our friends at Vibrance, reminding you that you can't stay in college forever, but you can do the next best thing, which is join Vibrance Professional Development Program. It's like taking a nine month course in the fundamentals of banking, but instead of shelling out tuition, you're the one getting paid. You'll also get expert career coaching that helps you choose the vibrant career that best fits your skills and interests. And sure, Vibrant Headquarters is no Iowa City, but it does have a full size basketball court, a fitness center, an on site coffee house, and restaurant, and an employees only bar. Best of all, they're recruiting now. Get all of the details at vibrantcreditunion.org slash launch. You're welcome back. Episode, I never get, I never get tired of that. No, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Episode there you 30 go. of Teed Up with Coach Rick Heller. Coach, how are we doing? Doing great. Awesome. Just finished you, practice. And yeah. Actually, Fall World Series game two and the... the the coach always wants to split the first two so you get the extra day to play game three. So <laughs> it worked out the way I wanted today. And, exactly. I, and I'll say as a player, we always wanted to get it done in yeah. the first two days. <laughs> so that not because we didn't want to play because it's cold. Yeah, It's getting yeah. cold. Today yeah, was better. Yesterday today was, was a cold, little better. Yeah, right? it was a rough day yesterday. And then, of course, the three days this week that are going to be bad, then it's going back in the 70s and we're, yeah. we're going to be done. But now the, the, you want to see all the guys get in, and especially the pitchers, and you have to save a guy back for game three. And if you sweep the and that guy doesn't get a throw, you know, the last time. Yeah. So it's it's going to work out pretty good. We're going to see everybody throw. Yeah. No, that that is. I mean, game three, winner take all. It'll be fun. Fall yeah. World Series always a good time. A lot, lot of trash talk, I would assume. Yeah, it was yeah. getting chippy. There, was it really? A little bit. I, I not like, bad. Good yeah. chippy. Yeah, good chippy. Good chippy. It brings up the energy a little bit, right? Yeah, gives and, you something to play for. Yeah. And then the, the chippiness hopefully takes your mind off <laughs> the cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it actually wasn't that bad today. No, we the, wind, played, the wind died down. Yesterday was pretty rough, but today was all right. We had to cancel a game. I remember my one of my I don't know what year it was. Yeah, but pushed it, was it to like, Monday the next week because <laughs> it was the same deal. It was going to warm back up. It was like thirty. It was like thirty eight degrees, <laughs> something like that. And we're, well, we we were, supposed, we were supposed to play Monday and we canceled because of that. It was mm -hmm. like wind chill in the low thirties, high twenties, and then yesterday um, the wind chill was like thirty eight the whole game. So it was pretty rough. But yeah, I wouldn't want to swing the bat, <laughs> dude. It's tough some of those days. But that but you get used to it, like playing. Like it's not like I mean, no. it, it's more fun obviously when it's warm, but. It was you actually kind of good. We've had such a warm fall that the, um, the 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 young guys, the freshmen from Iowa, especially, they don't play in the spring much. So toughens they, them up. Yeah. Well, they need right. to have a, have a game there. They see what it's going to be like right. in, in March. Yeah. No. Absolutely. All right. So we could just start with this. Uh, kind of talk about your background a little bit and what made you want to become a coach. Well, I love to play a lot, and yeah. um, so I knew at a pretty young age that I would do something in sports you know and 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 the hope was to play as long as as you could but um when the playing days came to an end um you know i i started out as a high school teacher um my first year out of college um had some trials with the baseball side you know it didn't work out didn't get didn't get the shot so i was a uh, uh Actually, my first job was varsity basketball coach in Bakersfield, Missouri, right right down by the Arkansas border between Mountain Home and West Plains, Missouri, <laughs> Mountain Home, Arkansas, West Plains, Missouri. And uh, believe it or not, that's a fantastic area for basketball because a lot of those small schools in the southern tier of Missouri, they don't play, they don't play football. Oh, really? So, so, I mean, it's 
hoops from the time school starts. And, Interesting. And, Why and don't they play football? I think money. money. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's just, it was kind of a weird dynamic for me. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, uh, right. it's a different part of the country. And, um, and we had two, two, only two boys sports in the school, um, foot, the basketball and baseball. Um, I, and I, <laughs> this funny story, because when I went down there, I, I couldn't get a job. I was like, man, I got like no interviews and, yeah. you know, sent a hundred apps out. And I'm like, well, I got to get something. And these yeah. guys wanted to interview me. And I go down there and, um, you know, really, really small town and kind of back in the hills. And um, I'm like, whoa, okay, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> and it was it was head basketball, um, junior high PE, and um, high school history, which okay. was perfect for me. That was that was my my, my ma- PE major with a history minor. Here we go. Yeah, and um, I get there the first day, and and I said, hey, who's the baseball coach? I, I'd probably help him out. He looked at me. He said you're the boys coach. <laughs> so, so I coached seventh grade basketball, A and B, eighth grade basketball, A and B, varsity, JV. I that think was, I, the, you know, the only guy that coached more basketball games that year was like Pat Riley, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, everything. and then right into baseball and, um, you know, was there for a year. And then, um, you know, you know, the, the big decision in, in my life was that summer I was supposed to, I was supposed to go work, um, a basketball camp at Upper Iowa where I went to school for my old coach. I was calling up to see, I was calling up to see um, when he wanted me to come, what time, you know, logistics. And I got the wrong number and I got the AD who was a guy named Mike McCready and all the wrestlers that, that listen in Mike's, you know, one of the best wrestlers in the history of wrestling, heavyweight national champion in two sports shot put uh, wrestling, um, Big time wrestling guy. But anyway, Mike and I got along when I was at school, and he just said, oh, hey, Rick. He said, um, Coach Pro's thinking about stepping down from baseball. Uh, if the right guy came in to take the program, um, what do you think? Of, would you be interested? I said, yeah, I'm <laughs> for sure I would. He yeah. said, well, let me tell you, you have to be the residence hall director too, and it doesn't pay anything. And I'm like, well, okay. Um, and he said, the residence hall, part of the job's a big part of the job. You know, you're not, yeah. you can't just come in and be the baseball coach. And, and so right. anyway, uh, I rolled the dice and a lot of people told me not to and took like a $10,000 pay cut. And hey, it was the best decision I ever made because you know how it is if you're a high school guy very long, it's really tough to get into college. And I knew yeah. I wanted to coach baseball at the highest level I could at, at some point. And you know, that, that dice roll, you know, gave me the opportunity to do it. And I, I, I was telling people when I was 12 years old, you know, the teachers will say, what do you want to do? And it was either, you know, playing or coaching or whatever. And I, yeah. I just, I just love the game so much. And uh, I knew I'd be involved somehow, some way. Did you know that you wanted to coach baseball long-term instead of basketball? Um, not really. If the bas- if he just said the same thing about basketball, you would have done the basketball. Yeah. Thing, <laughs> I mean, it, it didn't yeah. matter, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, you know, it, cause, cause I, I liked, I liked them all. I loved them all, but baseball was always, you know, my, my best sport and mm. the sport I figured I would end up in. But, um, you know, the basketball thing was a blast. I loved it. And, um, you know, I coached football for 10 years at upper Iowa. A lot of people don't know that because after the first two years at upper Iowa, the baseball, um, we were slowly getting it turned around and the dorm was just rough. I mean, it was a rough job. And, um, I said to the AD, if you can't get me out of the dorm, I'm thinking about going back coaching high school. And he said, well, what do you think about being the receiver coach? Well, I played football in college too. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was a receiver. And I'm like, yeah, I would gladly be the receiver coach and and, and to get out of the dorm. And so for the next 10 years, I was head baseball and uh, assistant football and uh, busy, busy. Uh, I didn't realize how busy I was going to be because uh, as we all know, um, well, football is rough with the film study and, and then oh, trying yeah. to be the baseball coach at the same time. Um, but it was a blast. It was a lot of fun and was a part of two major turnarounds that the people in a lot of places thought couldn't happen, you know, at Upper Iowa. I mean, there hadn't been – when I got the job there the, the first year, there hadn't been a winning season in like 16 years in any sport. And oh, wow. So, <clears throat> you, know, made, you know, three years later, um, you know, we have a winning season, um, you know, couple more years we win championship and then you know world series in the late 90s and seen a football program that you know hadn't had a winning season since maybe 62 um you know have some really big years lead the country in offense a year and it was it was a good time to be there really proud of the time i was at upper iowa and and then it was kind of the same deal with um 
getting into Division One, it you know, once you're a D three guy, they label you that. Tough to get out, you know. It's yeah. hard to get that break. And right. um, you know, we'd had a really, really strong run at Upper Iowa when things were going well, and um, felt really good about being there. I could have been there the rest of my life. You know, I wasn't like unhappy, but was really wanting to challenge myself to see how it would go at, at the Division One level. And the UNI job opened up. And um, I talked to Coach Schrag. Dave Schrag was the coach that left. He had went to Northern Illinois, and he's like, no, don't go here. He goes, they don't support you, blah, blah, blah. He's like, I'd love for you to have my kids, but not a good situation. I'm like, okay, I didn't apply. I didn't do anything. And then, like, two weeks later, the AD took a job somewhere else, and the new AD oh. came in uh, was a guy named Rick Hartzell. And Rick was a yeah, baseball yeah. guy, um, you know, had been at Iowa with Coach Banks as his GA, um, you know, loved all sports. Was, was Everybody was like, yeah, yeah, now you got to go for it. And had a few people in my corner, and, um, you know, they, they, they offered me the job. And But but a lot of people don't know that the UNI job is a tough job. We didn't have our own field. We had, you know, we played at the stadium in Waterloo, so we had to drive eight miles to practice every day um, and take care of the field. And they only had seven in-state scholarships. That was it. It's so basically, it was a pool of money. Whatever in-state room board tuition is times seven, that's your pool of money to divvy out. And we're playing against, like, Wichita State in the heyday, right. Creighton, Missouri State. I mean, everybody was good in the Valley yeah. back then. Uh, so I sit in the parking lot of the Unidome and beat my head on the steering wheel for an hour <laughs> saying, what do I do? Do I take this or not? You know, and the money wasn't good, and the cost of living was more, and my daughter was – playing basketball at Upper Iowa, and I'm like, oh, man, what do you do? And I jumped off the ledge, and again, you know, really, really happy I did. You know, yeah. that was a great decision and went through the the dropping of baseball 10 years later, and then you think the world's coming to an end and worst thing that's ever happened to you, and then land on your feet, you got a break, and, you know, Ron Prettyman, the AD at Indiana State, uh, hired me in August the year after that, and I uh, got a break at Indiana State, great place, and loved my time there, which – you know, was you know enabled me to come here. Yeah. What if uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna rotate to you just real quick. First year out of college, somebody says to you, "Hey, we want to hire you, and you're gonna coach every sport of every level, <laughs> every team. You have to be at every practice." <laughs> What do you like? How would you handle that? <laughs> well, you would learn a ton. I mean, you're literally uh, oh, yeah. thrown yeah. into the fire. Yeah, I was gonna say you get thrown into the There's fire. There's no in the other, fire. What, no assistant. It's great to learn. Like it's I mean, almost like I don't know. It's like <laughs> but, it almost might be too much. Like like. For you. <laughs> Like it's like, like it's like there's geez. so much going on. It's like you can't even keep it all straight. <laughs> the funny, the funny thing when it, when I was interviewing, I, I thought I better ask a question, you know, and, I, and so I said, "Hey, um, tell me a little bit about your PE curriculum." And they, they all looked at each other and they said, "Well, play basketball. You're the basketball coach." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "All right, here we go. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> free reign, <laughs> literally free reign." Um, so, and you also played. So you. you you went. You talked about that. You played three sports as well. You played basketball, football, and baseball. Um, you know, I think now that is so extremely rare yeah. to see that now. And I and I do think that there's. I mean, I I don't think I know that there is a huge. I mean, at this point now, being able to specialize and focus and mm -hmm. the, just the time I've had this year not playing baseball has been just what I can devote to basketball has been such a. I mean, it's just kind of crazy. Like, I feel like I'm bored a lot because just because of all the free time I have right. now. But, you know, it, it's like back in the day, you, you hear of a lot of people doing two sports. Three sports still is an amazing accomplishment in itself. So I guess just talk a little bit about that and what, what uh, like kind of what your daily life was like <laughs> as a three-sport athlete. Well, you know, it, it was a different era, obviously. Yeah. And um, the demands off-season weren't anything like – you know, they are today. Right. So that enabled that to happen. Um, you know, the, the, the thing for me was, um, you know, keeping busy was really important. Um, I always did better in school when I was in, you know, in the sport because my time was structured. So that was, that was good. And I was actually married and had a child during that time as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it was, it was pretty crazy, but, um, a lot of fun. Uh, the basketball, I had not intended on playing basketball. When I went, I was going to play football and baseball. And it was a Sunday. I technically wasn't supposed to be playing basketball. So I just <laughs> went over to a gym and, um, and I was playing 
playing a pickup game with some guys, and I said, so when do the when do the varsity guys play, you know, and this, and they're like, well, this is guy isn't, this guy isn't, this guy isn't. Not that I was great or anything, but I'm like, well, you know, if this is the varsity guy, then I'm going to go out at least, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> as opposed to playing intramurals. I might as well be playing as competitive as I can. And it was the toughest, it was the toughest adjustment because it was hard, it was hard to end the football season. You know, I always – you know, didn't get to play a lot until really after Christmas because you had to get back into it. But yeah. I was more of a, I mean, I just played hard and could play defense. I could defend. And so you always going to have a role, even if it wasn't big, I wasn't like a great shooter or anything, but I could play multiple positions in basketball and could jump. And so he could throw me in a three, he could throw me in a one. I, I mean, I was good enough to bring the ball up the floor. I wasn't a point guard by any stretch, but I could do it if I needed to. So he just kind of used me as a, a hodgepodge plug of and play. plug yeah. and play and yeah. you know six man sometimes and then you know when I got older you know I started some but it was primarily always like a like a six man come in give him a little burst on defense or whatever and, and so it was it was a blast I loved it and then you know was always able to do the double duty with baseball um didn't mind you know doing the extra work but yeah, yeah it was fun yeah so I don't know if you know this or not but Patrick was a dual sport athlete until Eighth grade, yeah, seventh grade. I just wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't get after on the mound a little bit. I could throw hard. I could throw hard, and I was pretty. I was good in center field because I can run and I can jump. <laughs> so I was pretty good in center field. I was, I was a decent hitter, but I, I just wasn't pretty yeah. mid. Yeah, yeah, like I was okay, but like I, I just. I didn't want to play because I just wasn't, and I had to keep missing tournaments, uh, baseball <laughs> tournaments for basketball, and the coach yeah. would get mad, and you I was like, mad. "I want to play basketball, so like I don't want." <laughs> no, that's that's <laughs> yeah. the way it goes. And you made you made a good call. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think you did the right thing. I just yeah. wasn't good enough at it to really, you know. I was like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, truth be it. told, I, I just really wanted to cherry pick and get dunks at the end of the game. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, so I, I give Connor all kinds of crap because he, he still hasn't got a dunk for me yet. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> Coach, I'm not a dunker. That's you got to get one. You, know, you got to get one. I do. You're, you're going to be healthy. You feel good. Just yeah. sometimes, even if you just go in and. When you shouldn't and try to hammer it, make your dad mad. <laughs> you one did time. that once. You did that against Michigan. I remember that. I did. I, I hadn't tried it my whole career. And then against Michigan, all you tried of to sudden, dunk on like four people. Oh, yeah. I tried to dunk on We were, we were high fiving. We played for Ooze and Oz back in the yeah. 80s. <laughs> <laughs> but, and hey, and hey, you're Dr. J. We were talking about Dr. J before the, yeah. before the show. I mean, that's. That's your guy, isn't that? That was that, my guy. That, you know, right. I was just, I've been a Sixer fan since um, you know he got traded from the Nets. So yeah, and my uh, dad as well. Yeah. Know? So I mean, I'm sure you guys have been able to tell some Dr. J stories from back in the day. Oh yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, like we were just talking before, a buddy of mine just got a job as a scout for the Sixers. So yeah. I'm, I'm hoping he can set me up and meet him before back, before yeah. I <laughs> kick the bucket. That would be a great thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that w- I mean, he's gonna make it happen. I, I hope got, so. I got. Faith. I think he can. It's I Doc. got faith in that. It's Doc. We gotta. We gotta meet Doc. <laughs> yeah, I got faith in that for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. I wanted to ask you this too. So, I kind of wanted just like your coaching philosophy. Just get into that quick. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, coaching both basketball and baseball and football, you see so many different team dynamics. Mm-hmm. From, I mean, you're coaching what is a team of 15 guys, then you're coaching. 35, 40 guys, whatever the year, 30 guys, whatever the year is, and then you're coaching 100 guys. And so one thing that I think really stood out from my time playing for you was your your emphasis that you put on 1 through 35 all needing to have the same goal, the same, like, no Mm -hmm. negative attitude, no negative complaining, like, focus on the same thing all the time. Not like the 35th guy who never plays ever can't have any negative drain on the team just as the first guy on the team can't. Is that something that you kind of – was that something that was taught to you or you kind of picked up on as you're coaching a team with 100 guys and maybe your 85th guy is a, just a negative <coughs> drag and is late and he's complaining? Like where did that come from? Because I, it's something that I've kind of taken and tried to use like even in a basketball locker room and 15 mm-hmm. guys because – you're on a team with 15 and one guy takes four guys with them. Yeah. Now you got eight or nine and then the team's, I mean, the team's close to halfway divided and that, I mean, you really got problems then. No question, yeah. Connor, you're, you're dead on. Um, 
you know, coaching, like you said, coaching a lot of sports at a young age and seeing um, how other guys handled it and didn't handle it, that type of thing. And especially in the football setting, you know, with such a big mm-hmm. number uh, when you really only had uh, a say over your segment, you right. know. And so um, doing that for 10 years, I would try to get our segment – to be, you know, the guys that were never negative, always positive, you know, try to take as many other guys that were on the fence uh, at the other segments that inside the locker room that were pulling guys apart or complain about playing time or complain about this. So I always tried to, to get those guys to, to be the ones that would help change the dynamics, even of a big football team. But, um, you know, turning programs around, you, you know, that's kind of been where I've where my whole career, you know, at, you know, places where a lot of people thought you couldn't win, you know, and and the first thing that I found you have to do, it, it can't be about winning games. It's got to be about being a winning person, winning the day, yeah. off the field, attitude, hustle, effort, uh, all those things have to be consistent before you ever have a chance to win. And and it and it, and it worked. At Upper Iowa, you know, the guys that that were there for the wrong reasons, the selfish guys, they. They, we parted ways, and um, you know, I just learned at a really young age that the only way you could get guys to overachieve, which is what we're talking about, you know, a lot of times we have to tee it up in those years with less talent. Mm-hmm. In fact, the majority of the time, the first six, seven years, you know, and same at you and I. I mean, um, you know, being honest with the players that we had to be our best, we had to play the hardest, we, you know, all that stuff. If we don't, we're not going to win, and we have no chance. And we may not anyway if they show up because a lot of times, you know, if they're talented and they show up, you probably don't have a, have a shot. You're playing Wichita State. They're ranked number five in the country. Uh, we're going in with seven in-state scholarships. Um, yeah. You know, just be real, and, be, and, and our guys knew it. Like, here's the deal. We have to play damn near perfect today, right. but we can. And, yeah. and, and, you know, I think – you and I had been in the league since 92. I got there in 2000. They'd only beaten you at uh, Wichita one time, the whole time. And, you know, we, we won the tournament there, beat them at their place in front of five, 6,000 people. And we beat them, you know, not all the time, but we beat them consistently. Um, it was just the attitude and the message and, and, and to do the things um, that do the things that you can control well. Um, yeah. And then everybody pulling the rope the same way. And that's kind of been the way I've done it since day one. Same thing at you and I. Or that that excuse me, same thing at Indiana State when we came there. Now it was a better situation um, than any of the, the the other two. But you know that's why I feel like we had success there. We had guys that all were there for the right reasons, played for the right reasons, um, hold people accountable off the field, which I think is really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't be a great guy on the co- on the quarter in the field and then be a bum off the field. It just doesn't work that way. And um, so you know that's that's just been the the, the thing that I tried to do and then one of the one of the big things was with my philosophy um, is you know I don't want a kid to leave our program that, that that to say ever that we didn't do everything we possibly could to help him be the best player he could possibly be whatever that might be uh, from a from a development standpoint standpoint whether it's his swing whether it's his big pitching mechanics or what whatever it is strength conditioning nutrition you know we try to close every box and the kids that come and, and really want to max out their, their potential. This is the place to go. Cause we're going to come to work every single day and be there for every single kid. And, and I don't want to ever have a kid walk away from here and say that we didn't do everything we could to help him reach his goals and be the best person uh, on the, on the field, but also off the field. Mm. All right. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's with that, we're going to take a, a quick break where we're going to get back into some of that right out of the, of the break a night out at El Rey's is a great time because you got the live music in the front which is usually like some country vibes you know a little bit and then but you can go to the back and then it's like a nightclub type atmosphere so like you get you get the best of both worlds from from both sides and bartenders take care of you it's a good spot we, we know some bouncers there great dudes yeah. shout out Loudon um, and the owner is also a, a phenomenal guy. So, based on the lines, you would think that yeah. the music is unbelievable, which which it is. So, I highly suggest that everybody goes to El Rey's. It's packed all the time. Hey, Connor, remember when we went to the Kimball Beecher Family Dentistry? I do. It was a it was a great spot. They got us out. They got us in and out quick. Very thorough teeth cleaning, and they told me my teeth were amazing. So they are good at lying as well. What? Well, I would hope that. But, I would hope not. 
Well, normally at the dentist, like you don't get in and out very quick. And like they like got us right in, took care of everything. Every the nurses were great. The the dentist was great that we saw. Um, you know, we, they have locations, multiple locations, and they they take care of you. So we have to shout out the Kimball Beecher Family Dentistry. Mr. Beecher is the man. He brought us like yeah, no, he's he's the goat. Here we are back, episode thirty of Teed Up with Coach Heller, Coach. I'm going to be honest. You guys got, I, I can't say the F word. I probably could if I really wanted to. You guys got screwed. You yeah. did. I was pissed about it. I, Connor was pissed about it. Isaiah was pissed about it. My dad was pissed. Everybody was pissed. I, I, but I was, I was probably not the most pissed, but I was up there. You guys, <laughs> I'm you, glad you were up there. You guys got screwed. Um, the Big Ten, we were just talking about it during the break. The, Michigan and Maryland were right there for a Super Regional a year ago. And, like, for some reason, the, they, the NCAA committee or whatever, however you guys do it, just decided to screw the Big Ten. I know you guys have had a great met resume. Rutgers won 45 games. Uh, and I'm sure you, you have a rant about this like I do, <laughs> except you know more than me. But uh, go, go, go ahead. Well, no, thanks, thanks Patrick, because you're right. I mean, um, it, it was just unfair. It was just wrong uh, on, on so many levels, uh, both us and Rutgers. Um, I would tell you that, um, you know, we go back to the, the year before COVID and Michigan doesn't win our league and doesn't win the tournament. Really, it was a, was a call that was reviewed that would have eliminated them from the Big Ten, Big Ten tournament that got overturned. They ended up winning the game, which got them the bid. They needed to win. They, everybody was saying they needed another win. You know, in that year we had five teams in, in the tournament, four the year before, four the year before, and we felt like we'd kind of arrived. I mean, as a coaching group, um, we have tried so hard to, to, to fight the other conferences, the Southern Leagues, and, you know, all the, all the stuff we have to do with kind of one hand tied behind our back. And, and we felt like Michigan doing that, playing for the national championship, you know, beating Vanderbilt game one of the three-game series for the yeah. national championship, that the respect that our league deserved would finally be there. And then, you know, the next year we're having an awesome year. We, like, 15-5 and five and beat North Carolina, beat Arizona, beat Duke, and then, boom, COVID hits. Yeah. And, and uh, that's it, right? And then so the next year – uh, unfortunately, uh, the powers that be in the Big Ten decided that we were only going to be allowed to play conference games only, and you know, and so for whatever reason, I mean, we played forty six conference games. To me, like nobody played a tougher schedule than that. Whether they played yeah. fifty six or forty six, nobody played. You know, the SEC played forty six conference games. You know, how do you say that's not a tough schedule? Right. Well, for whatever reason, um, they used that against us, and so you know, we got. I felt like we got. Uh, we should have been in the tournament the the year before, um, <clears throat> as well as uh, another team or two in our league, but didn't happen. Uh, and they that's what people said. Well, you should have played non conference games. Uh, well, we had no control over that, right? Um, yeah. So we come back this year, and and one thing I need to throw in is that we lost our rep on the selection committee. It's a ro it's a rotating committee, and and I guess it only has ten, and so you don't always have a rep from your conference on that committee. And I really believe that that was that doesn't make any sense. Makes, no. It makes zero and sense. And if there's ten, they should have all Power Five represented. Correct. Represented at least Correct. once every year. I well, smell a conspiracy. Yeah. Well, I, well, <laughs> you know, to be to be honest with you, I'm going to get to that because I mean. It is a conspiracy, but it, you know when you hear the logic behind it, it makes total sense. Um, in our minds, as the Big Ten coaches, when we go back to that year, Michigan about won it. We were like, "Yes, this is going to solidify things." Well, if you're the South and the powers that be, and and then let's even throw ESPN into this: um, who owns the ES, the SEC network? Who owns the ACC network? Who runs the World Series? Um, the, the the surest way to keep a Big Ten team from being in the World Series is to limit the number of teams that get into the regionals. You see this year, you know, they had nine teams from the SEC get in, and Mississippi, you know, underachieves the majority of the season. They play hot at the end, and then they carry that through, and boom, you know, they win the national championship, which is awesome for them. But you can't tell me we didn't deserve five teams in the, in the tournament if they get nine teams in the tournament. And like you said, the two teams that um, – 
both were were in from from our league represented well and really were a call here a call there from from going to the super regional so maryland and, got screwed too yeah that for the for sure interference runner mm-hmm. on I, I was watching that i texted i texted i think i texted both you and marty or maybe just yeah. one i said what is going on well and there was a call in michigan too that 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 they got that they, you know went, didn't go their way at second base that yeah. could have changed that entire game as well so anyway um Sometimes it takes something so bad uh, like that to happen to to make positive change, and we're all hopeful that this was it. You know, unfortunately, you can't go back and and give our kids who deserved a chance to be in a regional um, that opportunity. But it's up to all of us to keep fighting and and try not to ever let it happen again. And we've met as coaching as a coaching group in the Big Ten more than we ever have um, to try to come up with ways and ideas to combat it. Uh, Commissioner Warren uh, came to our meeting and he he spoke to the group and let everyone know how upset he was. He was he was just as mad as you were, Patrick. And he was he well, was I don't know, you know about he was, that. No, but he was pounding <laughs> he was pounding his fist. I mean, he wasn't happy. And I know our ads have met a couple times on it as well. And um, hopefully, I know this year, I, I think this year is the last year uh, we go without um, having a rep on that committee, and we should get a rep back the next year. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, by the way. Which, which, <laughs> which and none of them are coaches. I mean, they're all it's the also administrators. So, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's not right. Um, what happened wasn't right, because here's the deal. You know, you know everybody wants to talk about the RPI. <clears throat> well, if we just want to talk about the RPI, you know, it, it's never going to work for the North because this, they, they, they won't change the season. The powers that be um, hold on to the advantage of keeping us playing in the winter, which means we have to travel the first four weeks of the season at Iowa. Some schools first five weeks if they're further north. So you guys think about it. You know, you're supposed to go south. You're supposed to play quality teams, and you're supposed to win those games, by the way. Um, yeah, when you haven't practiced outside yet, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and which is BS. And, and everyone in the game knows that those games are important, obviously, but you play those games in, in late April and late May against us, it's a completely different deal, oh, you yeah. know. And, yeah. and we win nine of ten down the stretch, nine series and three games in the Big Ten tournament, and that's not good enough. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just wrong, regardless of what the RPI is. Because what happens in the RPI – if your league, if your league wins at a seventy percent clip or better, then when you start league play, what happens? It just keeps rolling. Yeah. So as a at Big Ten, thirteen teams, the odds of us having a seventy percent winning percentage, trying to play five weeks in the South, I mean, it's it's never going to happen the way it's designed. Yeah. What we've done is we've we've talked as a group. We're going to cut back the number of non-conference games. We're only going to play three weekends, which is what. Um, the ACC does because they have a buy in their league just like we do. So they got the three, boom, start ACC play. Well, if we can be smart with our scheduling, go down as a group with intent to try to win as many games as we can, uh, because really at the end of the day, it's more about the league winning at that percentage than who you're beating a lot of times. Because if you look at the ACC, SEC, all those guys' schedules early – our schedules are actually tougher if you look at them because we did. We looked at everybody's schedule. They're just winning them all. Right. You, you know what I'm saying? So so when you don't win them all, they say you should have played a tougher team. So what we're do- well, yeah, what we're doing at what we're doing as a league is to try to help our percentages by you know, starting Big 10 play even it's even if it's at a neutral site week 4. And then we'll still have our bye week. Um, so that's 4 weeks as opposed to 6 weeks we have to play non-con which gives us, you know, I think, a better chance to, to get that winning percentage up there. Then uh, the big thing is with the conference realignment, you know, with USC, UCLA coming into the league. Now, whether that's the end of it, you know, we hear rumors all the time. Uh, let's just say there'd be two more uh, out that direction. Uh, I mean, to me, that's the best thing that, that could have ever happened to, to our league uh, in, in baseball. Yeah. You get two, two schools uh, that have been traditional powers in baseball, two, two administrations that care about baseball. Yeah. Um, you know, it gives us a chance to hopefully find a way to play divisions because the, the Wisconsin not playing right now really kind of screws the schedule up. It's difficult to play 
divisions when it's an odd number of teams. If we had 14, we'd be 7-7 seven and seven right now, and, you know, it just work out way smoother. But anyway, with that being said, I just I just think with, with all this going on with the conference realignment that it's, it, it's the – the best chance that we we've ever had to to pass people and 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 you know make our league as as strong as as all those leagues that that people perceive as being strong okay here here's my thing though too is by the way rpi is rpi if i'm not mistaken is generally the the number one statistic or metric based system whatever it is that they the committee looks at when selecting teams mm-hmm. they look at resume yeah but rpi is like very very important because i remember talking to isaiah like it's like well our rpi is this and it yeah i mean know, it is when they want it to be connor yeah and that that's my thing is like look <laughs> it's at, easy to move the goalposts look, yeah like look yeah, at there's, basketball. A, there's a human element that's why a, that's why basketball got rid of the rpi exactly yeah. we, have, I was gonna say, we, we have we net we have yeah. ken palm we have correct like, think because it was because it was not a great it was not a great tool for i mean it doesn't it work what, in it, every it case is, no it doesn't because it punishes teams that have to play regional competition yeah because you look at iowa i can't i can't play i can't play um you know I can't play schools can't play five NC hours State away, or whatever. Yeah, on, like in a midweek. Yeah, when when other places in the south they have really good teams to play within an hour or two. You know, we we Iowa State doesn't play. You and I doesn't play. I mean, we're limited on who we can play, and there's lots of people like that. And, and, and the West Coast guys, they don't they hate the RPI because once the snowbirds stop coming for for their midweek stuff they're landlocked too that you know they they, yeah. they they have who they have and they feel like they've been cheated over the last you know five or six years because of who they have to play midweek games um so i i think the rpi um won't be around that that much longer i think there there is there is another system similar to what you guys have went to um that um I think we will eventually go to not this year, obviously, but I do think soon, if not two years down the road, we will go to that, which would be really helpful um, because uh, what I guess I was getting back to like how they use the RPI. I mean, if you see a big 10 team, you know, and, 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 and they played a good schedule and they did one thirty six games and they're in the top 60, say, you know, 45 to 60, that's like 20 if you were in the South. Mm. You know what I mean? And right. that's what they used to. They used to use common sense. And when you have a rep on the committee, he can argue for that because that's what the committee's for is to use common sense when it isn't always it isn't always right with what that, that RPI says. Yeah. All right. Well, we can get off that topic. Yeah, yeah. We can get off that topic now. I, I like Patrick, it. Patrick, thanks for getting us going on that, though. <laughs> it's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hold on. The, uh, the 10 rep thing, like – if there was like five reps, I'd understand maybe if you didn't have somebody on every year. But if there's ten of them, like that just doesn't make any sense to me, and it really pisses me off. And that gives me more <laughs> ammo for my argument going forward. But anyway, excuse you me. you need ammo for arguments for sure. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> um, Coach, I want to talk about how. I mean, I know it's still very very difficult, but how easy it makes your job having a staff like. Like yeah. Coach Marty, like Robin, like Pearson, like and 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 go back too. So like, I mean, throughout my career, I've had like maybe six or seven other coaches that have been <laughs> on staff that since left. You talk about Desi, Miggs, um, you know, Sean, y- yeah. Yas, Sean Moore. Like these are guys that were all really good at at you know different things and whether or not player. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody had their their own favorite guy that they connected with. Right. And so as a head coach, it's like. You have so many responsibilities, whatever, but you know, okay, Marty's got this, or Robin's right. got that, Pearson's got a handle today, Miggs has it handled. Desi, Desi, within five years, is in on the, in the dugout with the Yankees. Yeah, and five years ago, he was here as the pitching coach. So, just talk about what it's like as a head coach having these guys, you know, at, at your side. Well, it, it's it's fantastic, and and the th- the big. I think the key point, Connor, as you well know, is that as many coaches as we've we've lost uh, and moved up, uh, which we're all happy for those guys, the one consistent that was that Marty was here, mm-hmm. and 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 if Marty would have left in there at some point, you know that that would have made it really really tough because yeah. the job that Marty does is just fantastic, and the loyalty and how hard he works. And, um, you know, us being together, I coached Marty. Um, he was our second baseman on the 2001 Missouri Valley uh, Tournament Championship team. 
um, was only gone a couple of years and then was back on the staff with me at UNI. And then, um, you know, was so mad. Marty was so mad after uh, they dropped baseball. You and I got out of the game. He didn't go with me to Indiana State. <laughs> <laughs> so pissed. And then, and then I think a couple of years later, he was like, "Man, I wish I would have gone to Rick to Indiana State." But, but then um, things worked out when I got back to Iowa that um, we were able to get Marty uh, back on staff, and now we're looking at ten years here together yeah. um, at Iowa, and 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 having that stability and that partner has been really, really uh, crucial, instrumental. Uh, having a guy like Marty um, beside me is, is a, it's everything for a head coach when you got a guy that you can count on like that. And then, then, then we'll go back and talk about a lot of those guys. Um, you know, we, <laughs> man, you got Jeff Clements, you got Jim McGrain in the early years, you know, and, and those guys, you know, Jeff coming from the big leagues to, to the staff. And um, I haven't I, mentioned Gores either. By yeah. The way. And, Tom, and it will, well, the thing is, you know, how Tom bailed us out, you know, Tom, Tom was just out of pro ball, you know, and, um, had been around and, you know, works out with us and everybody knows him. And then boom, uh, we lose the pitching coach right before the season. Yeah. And it's like, Hey, Gores, you, you think he could be the pitching coach? Yeah. And, 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 you know, we, Marty and I were talking about this a couple of days ago. It's just like, man, the job Gores did never doing that. And, 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 there's way more to it than just coming in and, and being the pitching coach because you guys know as players when you when you lose a coach that you care for and you love man it's hard I mean it's really yeah. hard and and Absolutely. especially if the you know especially if the timing is poor which unfortunately for us we've lost a lot of guys to pro ball well the pro hiring cycle is now but really heats up December January and then we're losing you know we're we lost Greg Byron two weeks before the season started which was before you you know if you remember Greg but he went to the Cardinals two weeks before the season started um and then you know we're losing these guys right before the season and then Gores came in and and you know just did a wonderful job uh, handled the guys um relationship wise was he able to make it um easy on them you know losing a really high quality coach like they did um but yeah, he did a great job, and then you know now he's in pro ball. He told me the other day that I think he got asked to to go to Double A next year. So pump for him, Amarillo, and, Texas. Yeah, Amarillo, Texas, home the of sock the poodles. home home of the big Texan. If you ever go down there, the big it's, a, it's like seventy six ounce steak. By the way, boys, it's oh. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway, but but then you know you talk about <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, Scott Brickman. You know Scott was yeah. with me at U and I, and yep. um, you know we broke. We broke almost every pitching record. You know, the job Scott did those early years was was fantastic. And, um, you know, he moves out and, you know, wants to spend more time with his family and, and, and his son and get, gets a good job with the foundation and was, really helped us out there. But but then, um, you know, when Desi came in, when Desi came in, Desi really, I guess, it, instrumental in, like, our manager's program. Because we went, we went to a regional my second year here in Springfield. And we played Oregon, and George Horton was a legendary coach. He was coach at Oregon. You know, won national championship at Cal State Fullerton. And George gets off the bus, and I'm watching these guys come out. And I'm like, who are all these guys that are coming yeah. off the bus? <laughs> you know. And so, so we we talked to George, and you know, he had 16 managers that traveled to the regional with him. And I'm like, Desi and I looked at each other, and we're like, okay you know, can we do that here? Will, t will kids want to do that? You know, yeah. uh, because we were still in the old school, you know, the two field guys and they, they helped you with batting practice and shagging and right. stuff like, you know, picked up the equipment and the, the screens, which was fantastic. But boom, we started running it, gave Desi uh, the go ahead to do whatever he could come up with. And, and Desi um, really got that program rolling to a point where we're the gold standard now. You know, we had six, we had six guys go to pro baseball out of our manager program last yeah. year. Just fantastic. No, yeah. Chad Leistico wrote a really cool article about that. Yes. And yeah. I was like, I was, I, I had no idea that you guys had mm -hmm. such a big manager program, but that was, oh, I read yeah. that and I was like, that, that's cool. That was cool. No, yeah. it's, it's what, what those kids do. How, how they're so, so smart and so, unselfish i mean That's as cool. connor knows i mean yeah i mean just give so much for so little uh but you know it's so little as far as money goes but um for experience and chance to go out and and and, and get into a, a pro job if that's the direction they want to go um you know we've got superstars right now in the program that are going to get big time jobs and um 
uh, you know, I just, Desi was really big uh, in doing that. And when Desi, when Desi left, I was like, man, I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. And then, you know, Robin, I called Robin and Robin had been a friend of mine from you and I, and you know, it was always our tech guy and always our guy that we would go to because he was always dabbling, um, you know, coaching little league or coaching and helping softball or, you know, and he was coaching the hitters at, at, at you and I just loved the game and, you know, made a decision with his family. Um, you know, he was a strength coach in the Royals organization, never got rid of his, you know, his strength training certificate and just brings so much to the table from uh, a knowledge and work ethic. And then in, he's a fantastic instructor, as you well know. I mean, he's just a great teacher and great relationship guy. And so he took, um, you know, where Desi left off and he's ran with it and he's taken the manager's program to even new heights. And, um, you know, we strike out 600 plus guys last year and we've had the pitcher of the year the last two years in the big 10 and mm -hmm. just, you know, crazy, crazy stuff, you know, lots of guys in pro baseball, as many as anybody out there, you know, and I like had five again last year and, um, you know, Dylan Debit and Ben Butel and Duncan Davitt and Adam Mazur, you know, uh, in one year. And, and so, you know, to your point, I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, it's awesome. It's hard. It was hard replacing them because yeah. that part of it's very difficult because you know how fragile that is and how important those, yeah. those hires are and, uh, how stressful that can be because you, you, you don't want to take a step back. Right. And, and that's the one thing I'm really proud of is that, you know, we've had a lot of guys come through here and, and proud of every one of them and they were all super talented and great coaches but I feel like we we keep making steps up step ups yeah. every 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 single time and and um, that's important with the players as you know because mm -hmm. had two or three of those backfired you know when it happened with Desi say yeah. it, it would have been whoa here we go again mm -hmm. you know and and uh, you know maybe the team, the team uh, cans it, but uh, we've been able to to survive and not only survive but keep moving. Yeah, no, and and that leads us to this will be this will be the last question. But you talked about you talked about the guys that we lost after last year in a, in a positive way, guys that were drafted and guys mm -hmm. that are going to move on and play pro ball. But we we lost some guys um, on the pitching side and on the hitting side. But you look now, look ahead to this year's team. If you were to give a preview, we got. We got faster. We got guys that mm -hmm. were. I mean, we got some transfers. We got some JUCO guys that came in, and uh, I just think you know I've seen I've only seen one or two games, one or two of the fall games. But just if you were to give a you know a quick synopsis of kind of what's what we're to expect this year. Yeah, um, you know, we did take a big hit on the mound, and then I didn't mention uh, Peyton Williams. I mean, that's going to be a big blow. Uh, yeah, you know, Peyton signing with the the Blue Jays. Yep. Um. I feel like uh, we did a really good job um, of re of reloading on the offensive side. Not even reloading. I feel like it's we're going to be a completely different team. Uh, to your point, Connor, we're we're much faster than we've been. Um, this will we'll, we'll be able to we'll be able to put an outfield out there very similar to like we had when Joel Booker and those guys were out there um, when you had three center fielders, you know, going and, and that's yeah. nice. Um, right. You know, we can put, we can put a lot of guys on the field that, that can run and, and put pressure on people and cause problems And the, and the great thing, like some of those guys aren't very big guys, but you know, you know, you taught Sam Peterson, Kyle Huxdorf, uh, Chase Mosley, uh, th those guys have pop in their bat too, even though they're not, big guys and, and can hit the ball out of the ballpark. Um, and then Brendan Dorigi was a, was a big get for us, a uh, transfer out of Wolford grad transfer. Um, who's going to bring a left-handed bat and, you know, he, if he's not at first base, DH right field, wherever he's going to go. But right now it looks like he'll be at first base and then getting Keaton Anthony back was, huge. was huge. Um, yeah. you know, gives us, a um, uh, you know, one of the best hitters in the, in the big 10, you know, uh, freshman of the year in the Big Ten back, and um, he could have, you know, Keaton could have went. Yeah. Um, but but the thing I think you'll see this year is, is that uh, I think Keaton's really going to help us on the mound too as a, as a legit two-way guy. And uh, he threw today, and um, he threw well. Um, I think there's potential there for him to possibly be the Sunday starter. Um, Ty Langenberg's back, and I look for him to step up and, you know, potentially be that Friday guy for us and he won a lot of games on Sunday for us last season and, and, and was really steady uh, throughout the year so it's nice having a guy like that that has that experience that you can you can hang your hat on and then we got a I got a guy in named Zach Volker who transferred in from from Long Beach State yeah. um, had a really good year in the Cape 
made friends with uh, Ty Langenberg out okay. in the Cape. They're on the same team, and he was looking for a program that um, – you know, was a development program where where we're doing a lot of things that we are, and uh, it was a really good fit. And so, um, you know, uh, Zach decided to come here. I, you know, those three guys right there are, are you know, three guys that are going to be fighting for those three three weekend spots. And then, you know, big so big time freshman with yeah. K, K, with Cade Obermuller. I mean, yeah. uh, huge future for for Cade. Um, you know, Brody. Brody, you know, where Brody comes out after football, you know, we're all hopeful that yeah. that's going to be in, in a good place. And then, you know, we get Marcus Morgan going. Um, but Aaron Savory's a, another freshman um, out of Dubuque that that is, you know, really solid for a freshman, I think, can give us quality innings. And then Will Christofferson needs to step up and have a big year. His stuff is, like, off the charts on the, you know, uh, on the analytics and the spins. And he's got some stuff that you just don't see. And uh, just getting him to, to go out there and be consistent, hopefully he can be that closer like we've had. And that's one thing we you know. The one, one thing uh, that we've had in all – all nine years prior to this is that we always have had a guy that could close it down at the end of the game and, um, you know, finding a new guy after Dylan because he's been there for three years yeah. for us. And that's going to be a, a, you know, a big, a big spot, uh, who can shut it down. And no, we just have a lot of, a lot of good depth. Um, you know, is there a guy that maybe is the Adam Mazer that, you know, has that kind of arm? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. But if not, I think, um, the depth is better and, uh, we've got guys who can, who can get it done? And I like the makeup of the team. Guys really play together, play hard, and um, should be a fun year. Yeah, well, absolutely. Coach, I think, think the defense will be better too. Honestly, okay. I mean, I thought not that we were bad last year; we were solid. Uh, but I think it'll be even a step up. You know, Gable Mitchell coming in, and uh, Raider Tello from from California. Just some yeah. some some really good guys. Which makes there. you happy. Yeah, that's, that that the, makes the me the defensive happy. side of the ball. That's, yeah, that's yeah. like where well, you pit, really get after. I mean, I, you know, I'm a hitting guy. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but you know, after being there at that level, um, that's probably the biggest jump for the high school guys, yeah. and where they're the least accountable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you've you've seen it that defense and pitching is where it's at. You're yeah. usually going to score enough runs to win if you do those two things. Yeah, absolutely. Surprised that your defense uh, is is, is going to be better after losing Isaiah Flard. I don't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> <That's it. laughs> There's no Isaiah Flard slander on this podcast. <laughs> no, no, there there's some. There's no. some. <laughs> Well, Coach, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we don't want to take too much of your time, but we appreciate it. Um, we're going to have you on with this episode, and then we're going to follow one up with, with Marty as nice. well. Nice. So we, All right. Yeah, we thank you for coming on. Um, that, was a, that was a good app. It yeah. was. It was. Thank yeah. you, Coach. No, you guys Thanks, are coach. welcome and uh, fired up for your season, getting ready to go, yeah. and excited to watch. Should be fun. Should All right. be fun. Thanks. Right. Good luck. Thanks, Coach. Yep, thank you. Being an athlete means pushing your body to its limits. At the ReCenter, Coralville's all-new Holistic Wellness Center, you can get back in the game much quicker. The ReCenter offers a wide array of athletic recovery treatments such as IV therapy, mild hyperbaric chamber, oxygen therapy, infrared sauna, and Normatec compression therapy. So whether you have a big game or marathon you're training for, or you're recovering from a tough workout, come to the ReCenter to get rehydrated, refreshed, and recovered much quicker. Call 319 694 6086 to schedule an appointment. Student discounts are available. Now, from our friends at McDonald Optical. If Mr. McDonald is nearly as feisty as he was on the sidelines watching 8 through 10 year old Jack and his son Nolan, that means if you go to his eye doctor place, you gotta be in pretty good, you gotta be in good shape. He's gonna take care of you. Yeah, he's gonna take care. If you're having any issues with your optics, you gotta go to McDonald Optical because he's definitely gonna look after you. He's got the solution for whatever your problem might be. And uh, no, great, great people over there, 100%. And take care of you. Yeah, without a doubt.